I want to say that at this moment in our nation's history, the appointment of a commission that is composed of citizen members, of people who will volunteer their time over the course of the next year to look at the location, the concepts, the collections, and the fundraising to create a National Museum of the American Latino is historic. At this moment in our country's history, when cultural understanding could not be more essential to the enduring strength of our democracy, I am asking on behalf of the American people to carefully consider the importance of creating the Smithsonian American Latino Museum so that we may illuminate the American story for all. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Unfortunately for many Americans, the contributions of generations of Latinos are largely unknown. And I hope this committee will soon take action to right this wrong by advancing legislation to establish a national museum of the American Latino. Imagine what it would mean to Latino children coming to visit our nation's capital and seeing their ancestors' contributions to our country. What would it mean for children of different ethnic backgrounds to learn about the history of the people that look like their neighbors and their friends at school? These are the building blocks of acceptance and inclusion. But now we have the chance. We have the chance to correct the record, to present a fuller, clearer picture of our diverse nation. And the Smithsonian Institution, the official record of our history and culture, has the opportunity to recognize the fact that Latinos are as essential to America's history as they are to America's future. Buenas, everyone. My name is Maria Teresa Kumar, MSNBC contributor and president and CEO of Voto Latino. I am thrilled today to moderate a discussion about the future of the Museum of the American Latino. Today, we will explore the importance of this potential museum, representation, why it matters, and the journey it took for us to get to this point. With us today are Senator Robert Menendez of New Jersey and Senator Cornyn of Texas, two co-sponsors of the Senate bill for the establishment of the National Museum of the American Latino. We should also disclose here that Senator Menendez's daughter and a good friend, Alicia Menendez, serves as an anchor for MSNBC. Also with us today are Henry Munoz III, co-founder of the Momento Latino and former chairman of the National Museum of the American Latino Commission. Estuardo Rodriguez, President and CEO of Friends of the National Museum of the American Latino, and Eva Longoria, actress, director, producer, activist, and a commissioner of the Bipartisan National American Latino Commission, and also a good friend. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I want to start with you, Henry, because you have been such a champion from the very beginning of the need for our representation. Talk a little bit about how we got here. What is the history of trying to get a Latino museum on the National Mall? This is actually a movement of people that began over 50 years ago with a group of interested citizens working very closely with the Smithsonian Institution, our nation's museum, in effect, our Ministry of Culture, to make sure that the American story was told. So what has happened over the course of time, even before there was a commission, is an effort to create a presence inside of the various Smithsonian Institution museums to make sure that at air and space, at American history, at American art, at the portrait gallery in the National Design Museum, the stories, the contributions of Latinos have been told. And it happened really because of the actions of Congress in a bipartisan fashion. And that gave birth to the commission that um, took place. And I think we began our work in 2009 Eva was a part of that commission of uh, members across the country. And that's what led to this effort now um, that our senators are leading to try and make sure that there is a museum on the mall in Washington, DC. So what you're sharing with me is that it's been over a decade to get to this moment. Can you, Senator Menendez, shed a little bit of light? Why is there a renewed push today for the museum to be built? Why is this important? Well, I, I think there's never a moment since the time of the idea of creating a museum was put into legislation that there hasn't been a push to get it done. However, it, it wasn't until June of this year, almost nine years uh, after its first introduction uh, in the House, uh, that the House passed the National Museum for the American Latino Act by voice vote. 
And I think we have to give a lot of that credit to Congressman Jose Serrano, who was steadfast leadership uh, for spearheading that effort. It also helps that uh, the secretary of the Smithsonian, uh, Lonnie Bunch, has been supportive of diversifying the Smithsonian Institution's telling of the American story, which includes the creation of, of new museums. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with my colleague, Senator Cornyn, uh, to finally make this a reality. But this has been a continuing journey uh, for, for many of us. Uh, Javier Becerra starting in the House, Ken Salazar when he was here in the Senate with me, uh, taking it up, passing the commission, and then the commission's reports. Uh, so we're almost at the final leg of the journey. My only hope is that uh, that leg of the journey can culminate successfully before the end of this year. And Senator Corn, I wanna bring you in because in a time where we are so polarized in our politic, you have been such a champion of this bipartisan, uh, bipartisan effort. And in a press release from the Friends of the National Museum of the American Latino, this was, and quote, this will be the first Smithsonian Museum to have enshrined in its charter the requirement to ensure representation of the conservative viewpoint as well. Senator Cornyn, why is diversity of political uh, viewpoints important to the Latino experience and to the American experience? Well, Beer, we're a big diverse country and uh, not everybody uh, not everybody thinks the same as we know. And uh, unfortunately, in many ways, uh, the polarization uh, impacts our ability to function here in the Congress as we are representing uh, the American people. But there are some things that, uh, that, are, that bind us together. And that is our uh, appreciation for the contributions Latinos have made throughout our nation's history. We know it's the history isn't always, uh, well, it isn't written for Disney. Uh, it isn't all happy or pleasant, but it's important, I think, as uh, as one sage said, to remember our history or we are condemned to relive it. But to, to me, the part of that history is just uh, what Bob Menendez laid out in terms of the, the how we got here. Um, this started out with a report in 1994, aptly entitled Willful Neglect, uh, which uh, recommended the creation of the natural, um, National American Latino Museum. So this has been a long, long journey, but I think um, all you have to do is look around Texas or California or really any state in the nation and realize that Latinos play a critical role in our culture, in our economy. Um, many Latinos uh, volunteer to serve in our military and are uh, some of the best known and celebrated uh, members of our military, including the, the Medal of Honor Museum, uh, soon to be in Arlington, Texas. So this has been a this has been a, a very much of a, um, a pleasant journey uh, working with uh, Bob Menendez and our friends in the House to try to get us to where we are today. And I'm hopeful, as Bob says, we can get it over the finish line here before the end of the year. And Estuardo, as Senator Cornyn says, is that it, what the, uh, the Latino community has been part of the American fabric, oftentimes long before our history was even written as a country, as a nation. Our very own news Latino reporter, Suzanne Gamboa, recently wrote on the legislative effort and her story opened like this, quote, no story in American history doesn't include American Latinos. But oftentimes what I find, Estuardo, in our conversations is that people like to use the word unrepresented, underrepresented. And what I often say, it's not underrepresented, it is sins of omission because we don't appear in the history books. How can you give us an example of the contributions that Latinos have made to America? Senator Cornyn mentioned our military service. In fact, we, you know, we are much more in the military than we are representat representing in the in the population, speak a little bit of maybe some unknown facts that will enlighten us of why we need to be part of this critical moment and have a museum built in the recognition of our contributions. All right, well, thank you so much, Maria Teresa, for that question. We have really been focused uh, for the last 15 years on doing exactly that, lifting up so many of the stories that need to be told on our national mall. That is the, the nation's front yard where American history is told and when we talk about American history, unfortunately, it is presented as if the pilgrims came and moved from the east to the west to bring civilization, ignoring the fact that the first city in our nation, St. Augustine, uh, St. Augustine uh, Florida, uh, first capital in our, in our nation, Santa Fe, I mean, these, these were cities that were built 
um, by the Spanish. And in addition to that, the Mexican uh, influence throughout the Southwest hundreds of years of stories that need to be told. And ultimately what we're trying to say is we're not a patch on a, the American quilt. We are the thread that goes through the entire quilt. The stories that ultimately do feed into the Latinos and Latinas in military service from the, from the very first battle to present day, uh, leading in as entrepreneurs, as we know, Right now, small business is, is a key to energizing our economy and leading there are Latinas, Hispanic women who create more jobs right now, small businesses that create uh, the opportunity for economic growth to come out of this pandemic. I mean, this, our role has been uh, consistent throughout and I think the American Latino Museum on the National Mall will ultimately fill in those pockets that are currently empty in our history books and in our storytelling that will excite not just the Latino community, but excite Americans to better understand the huge impact and role that we've had settling and building this nation. It is something that is long overdue since, uh, as Senator Cornyn mentioned, the Willful Neglect Report. There were 10 recommendations in that report. Only one or two were actually satisfied, which includes the creation of the, uh, the Smithsonian Latino Center. But the biggest one, the creation of the American Latino Museum, 26 years later, we still do not have that museum. And I think we're now at the finish line and hopefully we'll be able to open those doors in the coming years. Well, and it's sort of the first of a context for the folks that are tuning in. Latinos for the very first time are the second largest population since 2003. We have become a voting age as a second largest population in 2020. When we look at where we are as a country and the really the divisiveness sometimes that we find in the rhetoric, most people would think that we just arrived. And that is not the case. As Eva, you often say, my family did not cross the border, the border crossed us. So I want to bring you into the conversation. And during a Senate committee hearing on this legislation, you said this museum, if built, would help others. Maybe not just from the Latino community, but also to better understand and appreciate diverse viewpoints and shared priorities as Americans. That's what we're missing right now. Elaborate a little bit more on this as we are about on to enter a new, a new dawn, so to speak, where we have a president-elect who wants to speak to the unifying of America and our strength. What do you say to this? Yes, I'm, well, I was very uh, uh, excited to, uh, you know, be on this commission because it was a bipartisan commission. It has bipartisan support. Um, and I think that if you look at our history's textbooks or our national monuments or, or our statues, they reflect only one kind of American hero. And um, that hero is white and male. And so there's so many extraordinary things that Latino Americans have been responsible for in the history of our country, scientific breakthroughs and military feats and civil rights accomplishments. And um, when you don't have that representation in the official record, then those contributions are, are often erased. And so if America can't recognize our past contributions, then America cannot respect our present significance. And so history is not supposed to be ideological. It's truth, it's facts. And for the Latino community, those facts are missing. And there is no story in American history that does not include American Latinos. We, we helped build this country alongside the folks who already have their place in, in museums. And so now to, to have a chance to correct the record and to present a, a full and clear picture of our diverse nation, um, it's important, it's important. And um, we, we have an opportunity to recognize the fact that Latinos are essential to America's history as they are to America's future. And so the people who get to go and, and visit this museum, it won't just be for Latinos, it will be for all Americans, all patriots of this country. Well, and I think something that you highlight is not just our contributions, but we should also document the real pains that we felt also during this moment. And it has not always been easy in the Latino community and folks just don't know. And in yeah. some cases, if you think of California, California, there was always Latinos historically there, right? We, we just didn't arrive one day. And so- Texas, <laughs> Texas, I mean, you said it. I'm used to it. Yeah, I'm ninth generation Texan. And so it's, uh, it's definitely uh, um, uh, a chapter is missing in the book of American history. And we want to make sure that we, we are included. 
Yeah, well, and I like to say, you know, a chapter is missing and all the, and the, the through bread, right? Like we've been there the whole time and giving yeah. that narrative. And I think that when we know Henry, that so many of our children, roughly 25% of our children um, are Latino right now, K through 12 in Texas is over 51% as Senator Cornyn knows. Uh, when our children don't see ourselves our reflections, they cannot dream of being the Sonia Sotomayors, right? So speak a little bit about not just representation, but why we also need to change the workforce that is curating a lot of the work that we see right now in the Smithsonian. In 1994, 2.7% of the Smithsonian workforce was Latino. Fast forward to 2018, it was only 5% according to the Smithsonian. What can the Smithsonian do better to increase this diversity to ensure that a Latino museum will be responsible, curated, and more importantly, will have a diverse staff? Because I think one of the things that we're having right now is that it's not just about representation, but it's cultural competency and making sure that our children can see themselves as well, not just as artists, but perhaps as the next museum director. You know, it's interesting when James Smithson, who I think really wanted to be an American, he was an English citizen, a citizen of England who felt like an outsider in his own country. When he gave the original legacy, the money, to mm -hmm. establish the Smithsonian Institution, he said he did it for the increase and diffusion of knowledge amongst all people. And I think that's what this is about. It's about American opportunity. It's about knowledge and education. It's about making sure that our next generation of curators, that, you know, curators, like we've worked so hard over the course of Estuardo and uh, the people at the Smithsonian Latino Center have worked so hard to make sure that there are curators and pro museum professionals in each of those uh, buildings inside those institutions to make sure that our perspective is represented because we already know, right? I and mean, everybody has said it, you know, until we ha our presence is felt in libraries and textbooks, in um, archives and in museums. What are museums? Museums are, are tools to educate um, our young people. There are places where we go to create cultural understanding. And so I think for sure um, the Smithsonian can do a better job and it recognizes that it can do a better job. If it's ever going to do a better job, it's going to do it in this moment, as Senator Menendez pointed out, when it has a secretary who is the first African American secretary of the Smithsonian, a person who has built the National Museum of African American History and Culture and who understands the importance not only of what you present in exhibitions, but also the people who are, who are policy makers and who are taste makers within those museums. So you're completely right, Maria Teresa. It's not just what you see in front of um, and in those exhibitions, it's who is making the long-term decisions about what you see. And I will say this, I've seen some beautiful things over the course of the last 20 years of this journey. I have, I've seen beautiful exhibitions. And one of the things that's been most important about it is that it's, they've traveled around the country because there's a high percentage of Latino children who will never be able to travel to Washington, D.C. like I did when I was 12 years old and a student in San Antonio, Texas. So it's important that the Smithsonian not only exists on the mall, but that it has partnerships and that it exists in exhibitions so that every young American child can see their museum. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Maria, this, I want to do want to add to that because when, when we served on the National Latino Commission, American uh, National Museum, American Latino Commission, we went on a nationwide listening tour. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we went everywhere in cities and suburbs and everything because Latinos are Latinos in every community, indigenous Latinos, Afro Latinos, black Latinos, um, every part of, of the different communities have different experiences and passions um, and that are informed by where, where and how they came from, where they call home. And we wanted our research and the commission to reflect that diversity because, as we all know, Latinos are not a monolithic group. <laughs> well, and Eva, it seems that the political parties just realized this this year. <laughs> We've always known that, and that we are not monolith. But with that, we also know that it is going to take resources, Estuardo. I was fortunate enough, you tapped me to join your, uh, to be on the board for a while on the American Latino Museum. And one of the conversations we often had was, how are we going to pay for this? And from our understanding, this museum is following the same 50-50 public-private funding split as the National Museum of the African Americans, where 50% of the funding comes from private sources. 
where are we on that right now? Where is the, is the private funding, has it, is it ready to go? Has it been secured? Thank you for that question, because I think it's an opportunity to once again thank uh, the, the new uh, Secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch, for paving the way. The work through the African American Latino, I'm sorry, the African American Museum, the opening of those doors. That's the second uh, museum really, after that, the African Latino Museum. Yeah, the and then I can bring in my stuff. <laughs> That's <family>. right. <laughs> but you, honestly, that museum really paved the way for us. Uh, many people don't know. There, there were two iterations of, of the effort to create an African American, African -American uh, history and culture museum. Um, this last iteration took roughly about 50, 55 years before they opened the doors. We've been at this for 20 years, so I'm confident we're gonna, we're gonna open up a lot faster, but thanks to their work, they're paving the way and, and explaining the, the, the return on investment to corporate America and, and individual donors on why it matters to expand on the understanding of American history was crucial to the success of the American Latino Museum. We now have corporations, Fortune 500 companies that reach out to us to ask us, how's the legislation moving? How, how soon will we see it moving forward? Because we want to be first in line to make sure that we're supporting the creation of a National American Latino Museum. So we do have great support from many companies. Um, I'm not trying to shame anyone that hasn't, but you know, great companies like Target and Coca-Cola and Univision and Telemundo, uh, many companies out there that have been supporting this effort. And I know that uh, it is a price tag that, as you said, a 50-50 model um, that likely will move up with inflation, but we've been working off a rough estimate of $700 million as the price tag to open the museum and run it for six years. 50% of that is going to be up to us. Uh, the individual donors, the corporate uh, offices that support this effort, $350 million is what we have to raise. And I think we're, we're going to be there. Uh, we're confident that we have those commitments. Uh, once this legislation passes, thanks to Senator Cornyn and Senator Menendez, uh, we'll be able to work with the Smithsonian and direct the funds that they need to start moving that uh, identification of a location on the mall and the opening of those doors. Maria Teresa, that's a very important question. Do you mind if I just say something to our two senators? Of course. Because <laughs> I know you- this was, this was not coerced in any way, not orchestrated. <laughs> oh, but, I, mean, you, I know you have a response. You, you, there, there will be a vote and you'll have to go convince your colleagues that the resources exist across the country to pay for this museum. And I, well, I don't want to steal their thunder, but, I, but you know, I've been involved with the Smithsonian Latino Center for a number of years. And, and there is a gallery that will open in 2021 that is devoted to these stories. It will be called the Latino, the, the Molina Family Gallery. And I can tell you that significant dollars, like millions and millions of dollars have already been raised, not just from corporations, but from generous donors like the Molina family um, to, to say to you and to the rest of the country that yes, the resources do exist to pay for this museum. We will pay our 50% of this. And I think that's it, our ability to do this. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, Senator Cornyn. One of the critiques of having a museum just dedicated from you know, one ethnic group and another. You know, in 2011, uh, Representative Jim Moran from Virginia told the New York Times that he, he didn't want to see a situation where whites go to the original museum, African Americans go to the African American Museum, Indians go to the Indian Museum, Hispanics go to the Latino American Museum. That's not America. Senator Cornyn, in a time where we could say that one of the reasons that we are at such odds, it's oftentimes because we don't seem to have conversations with what, when, one another. Talk a little bit about how you would respond to this type of criticism right now. Well, I think they misunderstand the purpose of the museum. I think the purpose of the museum is in part to reflect the diversity of the Latino population. And as we've just alluded earlier, it's not monolithic. Um, the Latinos are not monolithic. Many of them hail from different parts of the world, whether it's Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Mexico, uh, just to name a few places, Cuba. Um, and so I think uh, this will be an educational experience for, uh, for many people who think they understand the Latino community. They will find out that they do not. And what they've done is viewed it in a very superficial and simplistic sort of way. But I also believe that it serves another really important purpose. And I think Ava was uh, alluded to this, and this is uh, for young 
Hispanics can come to this museum and learn more about their own history and learn about the uh, challenges that, uh, that their predecessors have overcome in order to accomplish what they were able to accomplish and give them more hope and more confidence that they can contribute in a personal way to even a better tomorrow. So I think uh, it's uh, looking at this as just an ethnic museum, I think is uh, misunderstands uh, the, uh, the, the complexity and the importance of, of this museum. Well, and Senator Cornyn, I, one of the things too, I think we would agree, you know, I, I will never go to space, but I'm still very interested in going to the Air and Space Museum, as many others would, right? So it's, it's more of learning from each other. And the museum allows that forefront. For folks who are listening to that, the buzzing in the back, I believe those are senatorial votes being called in. Is that correct? Is that what we just heard? <laughs> I think that was just the closing of the last vote. So oh, I, I think we're good. <laughs> We're great. Okay, so you, no one's going to be diving out anywhere. Senator Menendez, as Senator Cornyn alluded to, oh. are very diverse in what we in who we are. Is the Latino American community uh, museum a little too encompassing? I don't, I don't think so, and I think John said it very well. This is this is not about uh, uh, this is about American history, because what what I think is so unique is that somehow there is a sense that the origins of Latino presence in the United States uh, have little, uh, have to do with economic migration, as many believe today, when in fact, it has more to do with American expansion. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that, uh, as uh, Estuardo said before, before, uh, you know, a half a century before English speaking colonies, uh, Jamestown, Virginia, uh, came to be, uh, there was Spanish already being spoken in a settlement in St. Augustine's, Florida. As a matter of fact, the founder of St. Augustine's was somebody named Pedro Aviles de Menendez. I'm looking for a title search to see if I ha have any property there. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is uh, because of our unique cultural and ethnic diversity, which encompasses indigenous, uh, African, European ancestry, uh, our roots in shaping this country predates the idea of America. So in my mind, this is not just about Latinos. It is part of a fabric, an interwoven, foundational of what the American experience is all about. And so just as we rejoice in going to the African American Museum, because we understand that as an essential part of our history as America, uh, so will the uh, Latino Museum uh, ultimately be part of that American history. So I don't think it's too over-encompassing. I think it's actually embracing uh, of what uh, has existed long ago. I mean, uh, when, um, when I think about uh, our support before the nation, there was a guy named Pedro, uh, I mean, Bernardo de Galvez. Bernardo de Galvez was the Spanish uh, uh, governor of Louisiana before Louisiana was a full state. He led an all Spanish contingent against the British uh, and helped thwart uh, their drive against George Washington, a critical battle on the American Revolution. Given American citizenship by the US Congress, I hung his portrait uh, for the first time as Congress dictated uh, it to be done, but never was done in the Senate Foreign Relations uh, Committee room. He hangs there now. That's just part of our history. Uh, or David Farragut, a Spanish uh, army captain who ultimately uh, led ships in the Civil War on behalf of the Union. Farragut Square in Washington is part of that history. So uh, this is not all encompassing. This is the essence of what America is all about. Ava, earlier you had mentioned how when you were part of the commission that the commission solicited feedback from the country across the nation, from Chicago to San Juan to Los Angeles and places in between. What did you hear back from the, those attendees that really moved you and said, this is something that we need to have on the National Mall? Yes. Um, it was, uh, like I said, it was a, uh, a listening tour because that's what I think we should be doing more of. Um, but traveling in the country from, from Phoenix to Philadelphia, it was no surprise that there was very little representation of, of Latinos in the greatest museums across, across our country. Um, and if, with, with each stop, members of the community told us, you know, this, the type of art and the artifacts and the stories that should live in a national museum. But I, I always say more important than, than what it should 
contain, it's what it would represent, which mm -hmm. is finally an acknowledgement that we too are heroes in American history. We too are patriots. We too take pride in this country. And, and to also speak to your earlier point about um, criticism of like, Women's Museum, African American Museum, you know, the Latino Museum, our institutions must be large enough to hold the truth and the expanse of American history. It has to be large enough to offer representation. It has to be large enough to offer inspiration and to offer the promise of a very bright future to all of our nation's people. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing to have many institutions, specifically with the Smithsonian, that's the official record of our history. Well, and I love that framing is that our institutions have to be large enough to tell the truth. I love that framing because I think it, it speaks to why getting into the nuance of the difference in the Latino community, for example, is important because we have had different experiences of, of how we got here, whether it was economic or whether we were here long before the settlers, as in your case, Ava. So I think that's super, I, I think it's not only a beautifully pro, uh, phrased, but more importantly, it speaks to being audacious in a moment where people sometimes don't quite understand the Latino experience, us included. And so Henry, I want you to reflect back on the demographic shifts that you have seen in the American Latino community over the years. Uh, when, for example, when Voto Latino started, there were 30,000 Latinos turning 18 every single year. Now there is a Latino coming of age every 30 seconds. How far we've come. What has changed since you first commissioned the, the report? And what do you think has stayed the same? Well, we're the fastest growing youngest uh, population of this country. The thing I've always said to the leadership of the Smithsonian is what is good for the Latinos is good for the future of the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and many of us were born in the United States. I think there's a, this idea that we're all immigrants that just came to this country. And clearly the story of America is not that at all. And so I, I, I want this place to be a place that belongs to all Americans, where people realize that the artifacts that are inside of it uh, belong to us and tell our stories. Let me give you an example. You know, uh, my, imp my impression when I walk into American history is that it's not just the truth, but it's real. That's really the Star Spangled Banner. Mm -hmm. And it belongs to all of us, right? When Lonnie helped build the National Museum of African American History and Culture, you know, my family is not the, a slave family, but the most touching objects that are in that in that museum are, are stories, objects that tell the history of these families. And so given the fact that in many ways, although I don't believe that demography is destiny, that we have to fight for it and educate our people and, and in many ways um, seize those opportunities to make sure that institutions response, respond to us, create institutional change in libraries, universities, schools, textbooks, archives, that this is a wonderful opportunity for the Smithsonian to capture this shift toward the future of the United States and to make sure um, that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, you think about the nature of the Smithsonian. It's not something that you plan for the next year or two, something that you plan generation after generation, that it's a place that remains vital because it continues to touch all American citizens. Well, and I think that you really underscore the changing of America and that how that has to also reflect. My daughter is in third grade and technically she represents the first majority minority country of her generation. And that is powerful, but it's only as powerful as if she and her you know, and her fellow um, fellow students can actually see themselves in the country and the fabric of which they're ra being raised in. And with that, I wanna ask you all to join and indulge us just a little bit in this lightning round. What historical events, movements, or person, or persons, or art would be most important to have featured in the museum? And Henry, I will start with you because I know that you are an art aficionado. Um, I, I'm going to go back to something that uh, Senator Cornyn talked, which is the, the history of our patriotism in this country. I don't think that there's enough attention paid to the contributions um, that people like my father, um, that Eva's father, other peoples have made to the military history of this country. I grew up in a family that where my father was very, very proud 
of the fact that as a first generation American, he had an opportunity to serve in World War II. We are winners of the Congressional Medal of Honor, right? We continue to sacrifice our lives for this country. And I think that's something that is very meaningful. When you are willing to give your life for your country, there is no greater honor that the country has because of you. Senator Cornyn, same question. Well, well as, we, as we were talking, um, I was thinking about Sam Houston. And, uh, you know, we talked about, Ava talked about the border uh, crossing her, uh, her family uh, nine generations ago or so. And uh, of course, the history of Texas is one of, uh, of conquest and, uh, and independence from Mexico and uh, annexation to the United States. But if it hadn't been for Andrew Jackson, who sent Sam Houston uh, to Texas uh, to lead part of that effort, Texas would not exist as part of the United States of America. And uh, we, uh, we now have roughly 40% of the population of Texas, of so the 29 million of us are Hispanic. I think many people would be surprised to know that in Harris County, which is Houston, Texas, uh, nearly half of the population is Latino. Most people think about the Rio Grande Valley and, or South Texas as being where Latinos are concentrated, but uh, they are uh, throughout, they are, they are basically throughout our state and throughout the, the country as we've, we've heard before. So um, to me, this, even talking about this brings back memories of contributions that have been made by Hispanics over our history. And I particularly appreciate Henry's observation about military service. Uh, it, when an all volunteer military like we have today, Hispanics are disproportionately represented because they are patriotic Americans who love their country and are willing to sacrifice in order to preserve the freedoms and liberties that we enjoy. And that is to me a, a story that's uh, worth telling over and over again. Senator Menendez, what historical event, movement, or persons or art would you like to see featured in the museum? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I would take the rest of this conversation because there's so much, but uh, I would just say, First, you know, I wouldn't like to, I wouldn't mind seeing a, a flag or some soil from St. Augustine, Florida, which was the first uh, place in America uh, where Spanish was being spoken before uh, English was uh, even the, uh, the, the language of what became the nation. And also, I would love to see the Congressional Gold Medal given to Los Morinquineros, an all Puerto Rican infantry division of the U.S. Army, among the most highly decorated in U.S. history which Congress gave the Congressional Gold Medal a few years ago, I was privileged to be there. Um, you know, it, it is an example, as, as Henry was talking about, just one, but it is an extraordinary example uh, of our service and our sacrifice far beyond, far beyond, disproportionately so, from our population. Estuardo? Well, thank you for the question, because uh, as we've been doing this for so long, there's so many stories, but I will tell you that after this pandemic is over, <laughs> if you get a chance, going up 16th Street here in Washington, D.C., the old Spanish residence has a small room, maybe 400 square feet, 500 square feet. In that room, they have an entire exhibit that is dedicated to the work of the Spanish in assisting George Washington. And not just the Spanish alone, but bringing Central Americans from Honduras, um, uh, Salvador, uh, Guatemala, and, and Mexicans up to help create a supply route for George Washington. No one really knows about that. No one really understands why the Spanish wouldn't play a larger role, be more public about their support. That's one exhibit that matters a great deal for me personally. One, because I've learned a lot through these years. But more importantly, the museum itself is not about the four walls and the ceiling. The museum is about educating people to understand that we are not a community that is invading. We are not a recently arrived community that's threatening to take any jobs, but that we have always been here. And perhaps through educating them on that kind of history, we'll be able to avoid the kind of massacre that happened in El Paso over a year ago, where someone drove six, seven hours out of their way because they felt that there was an invasion happening on their border and they walked into a community in El Paso that has always, always looked like that. Thrived and grown and helped 
not just the local economy, but the national economy. The museum has a greater impact and a greater mission to dispel myths that divide us, and in fact, bring us together. Absolutely beautiful. Eva, what would you, what would you like to see in the museum? Oh gosh, this, do we have another hour? <laughs> um, there's so much, so much. And I think uh, to, to piggyback on what you just said, Estuardo, is um, to dispel the myth and the hashtag go home. We are home, we've been home. And to be able to have oral history in the museum that sees ourselves as makers of history. You know, uh, uh, there's large indigenous populations, indigenous history, all of our experiences, to know that all of our experiences are connected to larger issues. If you look at um, ethnic studies, um, and if you look at uh, everything that happened in Arizona with, um, you know, the, the legislation there over the last 10 years trying to ban ethnic studies and ban Mexican American studies, um, all of the teachers of ethnic studies argued that the courses gave students a pathway that broke cycles of poverty and violence and incarceration because kids react when curriculum speaks to their experiences. So imagine a Smithsonian Museum where uh, a, a curriculum and an exhibit speaks to their experiences. So it's not about promoting one ethnicity, it's, uh, it's an obligation to ensure that our heritage is, is aptly reflected in how we talk about America. Um, and, and so making sure that all of those oral histories uh, um, and dispelling the myth that uh, we are not from here if people knew the, the history, then maybe they'd have a greater respect for our contributions today. Um, the, the other thing I would like to, to, to see reflected, obviously years from now, is how Latinos showed up in a global pandemic. You know, COVID has disproportionately affected our communities of color. 34% of essential workers are Latinos. That's your healthcare workers and your nurses and your farm workers. We didn't need a pandemic to tell us farm workers were essential to our economy. They've always been essential, uh, but yet I would love that reflected in history, 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 years from now to say Latinos were there on the front lines and they showed up in a big way to help keep this country going and to help the economy, uh, but also uh, risking their lives and they're still doing it today. And so I wanna make sure that moments like this are recorded accurately. Well, and Ava to that, even in the middle of a pandemic, Latinos came out, showed up, and out and voted their hearts out uh, to change the course of the White House. And I think that is important because oftentimes folks don't realize the insurmountable issues that they've had to come just to cast a ballot in this election. I want to thank every single one of you for the conversation, but more for being part of a journey. Uh, when Estuardo first talked to me about the Latino Museum 15 years ago, he said it was going to take 15 years, uh, almost to the date it actually happened, but it's been realized because of the visionaries that you are, but also for the stalwart work that has happened on the Senate side. Thank you so much, Senator Menendez, Senator Corny, for the work that you do. I know that it is not easy sometimes in such heated environments to be able to sit down together and see a brighter future of America by speaking to our unity. Uh, Henry Munoz, thank you for this conversation with Momento Latino. Eva Longoria for always speaking truth about the needs to see ourselves on the screen behind the scenes so that our children too have that aspiration. And Estuardo for being such a longtime friend, but also for making sure that people understand that this dedication is not just for the Latino community, but it is for America. I wanna thank NBC Latino for this conversation. It is not only timely, but it will help us be the light of our true North moving forward as a country. Thank you, everyone. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.